Hello and welcome. First of all, I'd like to welcome our live audience from around the world. Many of you are joining us from all over, Australia, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, uh, North America. Um, we're here to talk about the, uh, we're here for the third series in the My Conversations with the Mystic. And I'm here with Sadhguru, a yogi, a profound mystic, and, and my guru. Um, I'm Chris Rado, owner and driver of World Racing. We're a professional motorsports team here in North America. We build and tune some of the fastest machines on four wheels. Many of you say, why is a guy like me here? Well, let me tell you, about four years ago, life looked so good on the outside, but on the inside, it wasn't so good. I was a professional racer struggling just to keep myself alive. You know, I was, at the time, I was racing about 27 events a year and struggling just to make it to each event, struggling day by day just to live. And, you know, I went to many doctors. I had many, many, many health problems that no doctor or hospital around the United States could figure out. And at a point, I was, I was close to giving up. I had some very good friends that, you know, in, my, in a time of desperation and need, showed me a flyer of this thing called inner engineering. And at the time, I was very desperate, you know, struggling again just to, just to live day to day. You know, I'd be, I'd be going to the hospital every two to three weeks by ambulance as my body is going into shock. And to me, that was no way to live. And at that time, I honestly didn't even believe I would live very long because it was no way to live. Three, four hours a day, debilitated every day. Once every two weeks, I'm on my way to the hospital. No way to live. So again, one day a friend brought me this flyer, Inner Engineering. And it just happened to have Sadhguru's picture on it. So me not knowing anything about yoga, meditation, or the spiritual process, but just struggling to live, I said, you know what? I need something because what I'm doing is definitely not working. So I signed up for the program, not even knowing where exactly it was. I just knew that it was in Los Angeles. And at the time, this is where I was living. So I was really pleased once I got the email that the program's only two blocks from where I live. What are the odds of that? So I came and I sat in on the first, the first day of the class. And I'll never forget, you know, I've never heard anybody say the type of things that Sadhguru was saying. At first I said to myself, it can't be this simple. Like, am I this much of a fool? I've been, you know, I've been pretty successful in my career and I thought in my life, but obviously the proof was in the pudding. You know, I was having a hard time getting out of bed or even just, like I said, living. So, and again, I've never heard anybody say the things that he was saying. And something said, you know what, Chris? You need to listen to every single thing this man has to say and take it to heart because you know what? Whatever you're doing is not working. So needless to say, I stayed for the program. It was a six-day program at the time. And we were initiated into med meditation on the fifth day. And on the sixth day, the program, program ended. And I went home. And, you know, everybody has their idea of what meditation should be like. And, of course, I had an idea, too, because, you know, 31-year-old race car driver that knows everything. Not the case. Well, the first day after the program, I woke up. And I didn't have the health problem that I normally had every single day. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I just got lucky because every now and then I'd get lucky and I wouldn't get sick. Well, sure enough, the next day, I wasn't sick again. And another day, not sick again. So after the, a whole week of not having any health problems, I said, you know, what's going on here? And as a matter of fact, I've never had another health problem like I was having ever again. So at that time, I said, wow. I, first of all, I had no idea what had happened to me. No idea. I, cu I couldn't fathom what had happened to me because I had tried everything. I tried changing my diet, exercising in different ways. You know, I probably had... 70, 80 different tests from hospitals all over the United States over a period of about five years to no, to no avail, no success at all. This one program, six days, sitting with Sadhguru and him expounding upon life and teaching the inner engineering program seemed to take all this away overnight. <laughs> Needless to say, I was dumbfounded. And from that moment on, my life started to change. You know, that year, like I said, I struggled to do 27 events the year before that. That year, which was April 2007, 
That year, I did 57 events, effortlessly. I never had another health problem, and from that moment on, I said, okay, I'm on this fast track now, and I gotta get, I gotta find out more about what's going on here. How, how did these changes happen to me? What, what was done to me? What happened to me? And you know, to this day, I'm still kind of boggled about that. So I grew, to be honest with you, you know. And um, I mean, first of all, you know, I'd like to ask you, what, what did happen to me? Because I still don't know. I just know that all of a sudden, life seemed to get really easy, and I didn't have the problems that were holding me down every day. You know, and that's why ever since then, you know, I've I'll do whatever I can to to help volunteering and be a part of the volunteer network. I mean, it's it's been such an honor to to work with everybody at Isha and get involved in the different programs and and whatnot. And I was hoping maybe you can tell me what really did happen to me because I'd love to know. As you just said, uh, that you tune prepare and tune the fanciest machines on the on four wheels. Yeah. <laughs> so the cars that you tune and drive, same cars are being driven by any number of people on the street. What they can do on the street and what the same car does on the racetrack touching close to 200 miles per hour. For people who don't understand what that is from other parts of the world, it's 340 to 350 kilometers per hour. So, to make a machine function like that, same machine, it's a certain level of tuning up, isn't it? So we just did a little tune-up on you. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it was a big tune-up, <laughs> to be honest with you. Seems like it was a big tune-up, but I'm, I can't tell you how grateful I am and, um, you know, it's been a wild ride. It really has. Ever since then, I've been to your ashram in India, I've been to your center here in the U.S., I've been to Kailash, I've, I've pretty much taken every program you offer and uh, just always thirsting for more because this, this life keeps, keeps getting better now and, you know, here I thought I had everything figured out and it turned out that I didn't have anything figured out. I just knew how to turn the circle a little bit and press the pedal. <coughs> but um, even that wasn't going to get me anywhere because I was, I was flat out. My, my race car, was, it was out of tune. It was misfiring constantly, spitting out oil. So um, I can't tell you again how much of an honor it's here to be, it is to be here with you. And I know many other people are with us from around the world. And, you know, I have some burning questions. And we're also going to take some questions from our audience that have been submitting them over the past two weeks. And if we have time at the end, we're even going to take some questions from a live audience. But first of all, I have to ask you, <laughs> how was your experience today? <clears throat> uh, I was in a race car, all right, which can kick up almost 800,000 BHP and touch close to 200 miles per hour. But as, I al as I've already in always insisted that the most difficult thing to race with is yourself, <coughs> not somebody else. To be able to take yourself to the limits but never breaking up. That's the sense of life. One who saves himself never gets anywhere. One who crosses the limit, of course gets somewhere but he won't be here <laughs> To be able to get to the last point and still not flip over is the essence of life. Is the very essence of yoga too. But if you want to drive yourself to that last rev possible, highest rev possible, your machine should be good. You must keep this human mechanism, which is the most sophisticated machine, not your car, I know. <laughs> as I'm learning, as I've been yes. learning. All those gadgets, all those machines came out of this machine. Yes. It's just a small manifestation of this. Yes. So to keep it, keep this one tuned up so that it can rev at the highest rev and still never flip over. 
is a certain understanding of the machine, first of all. The deeper your understanding, the better you do it. So today morning when I was driving, I initially decided, first of all, let uh, me understand the track. Mm. I know machines on four wheels and two wheels, I've done enough of that in my life. So first of all, to understand the track, I was just trying to build it in my memory so that I don't have to think. And the next thing is, uh, I've never been in… I've been in different types of machines, some of them racing ones, but uh, I've never been in such a mean machine <laughs> <till> now <laughs> That was a mean one, okay? Right, wonderful. <laughs> uh, I don't think most people can imagine how much power a car can generate. I mean, they see it on the television and it goes vroom vroom like an insect. Right, they don't feel it. They don't feel what it is. Yes. And uh, how many things could go wrong in a moment? Absolutely. Everything. Yes. Just about everything could go wrong because everything is being stretched to its maximum limits. So that's my life all the time. So uh, you must have noticed that I was not excited because it's still not reaching any place where it would be exciting for me. <laughs> Just getting used to everything. So, hitting some reasonable speeds, but even if I stretched it to 200 or 210 miles per hour, I would find it accelerating, but not… I wouldn't be panting for it. Right. Because… <laughs> Because my machine is tuned in such a way, it can take just about anything. If the car plunges into something and that's going to be the last plunge of my life, still this machine will handle itself till it's messed up, <laughs> okay <laughs> So because I tuned my machines like that and kept, it, it takes everything well, it doesn't matter what it is. So this is the thing about everybody's life. They want to do many things. Now you want to win a, win a race, you've been in racing as you were saying, but you're cracking up <clears throat> all the time. It doesn't matter what kind of racing machine you have, how much expertise you have, if this doesn't hold up, you're not going to win anything. Nobody wins anything. Success does not come to you because of your desire. Success comes to you because of your competence and your balance. That's something that most people don't work at. They think it will just happen. It doesn't happen like that. I had to learn the hard way. Naturally, by nature, different people are at different le levels of competence and different levels of balance. But that's not the point. The point is not about whether you're better than somebody. The point is just about, are you able to use this one to its maximum rev? Can you drive this one at full rev? I'm driving better than you, that doesn't mean anything to me. Taking joy that somebody cannot drive properly and you looking at him and thinking you're a great driver is a silly way to think. But you driving at your limit, you know you're hitting the last point, you know if you push it one more point, that's the end of you. Yeah. But you keep it at that point, you have the balance to keep it at that point. You have the courage, you have the competence and above all you have the balance because when you reach that point, if somebody is doing little better than you, you think you can push it and that's when life ends for most people. So to have that competence and courage but not to be overwhelmed by your own competence and courage, not to become blind to the realities of the existence, to be able to be at that last point and never tip over, just stay there. If at all if something bad happened, it happened because of some other factors, not because many other factors are involved, it's not just yes. you. There's so many things, the machine, the road, somebody else may come in and so many things may happen. So because of those things, if something happens, it's different. But because you don't have the balance to stay there, you don't have a realistic picture of who you are and where your competence is, that would be a disastrous way for any human being. Whether it's racing or living life or people's emotions or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. one may do in their life. So people who keep in their safety limit, 
who drive at forty kilometers per hour and they think they are safe, I'm not just talking about the cars, I'm saying life itself. Uh, absolutely. You just… they drive in an extremely safe band. You never know the beauty of stretching yourself to the limits because the whole system of uh, what you are referring to as spiritual process or yoga is to be able to sit here and raise yourself above the physicality of who you are. When I say physicality, physicality is your limitations. What you call as a physical is a bundle of defined limitations. Just sitting here and crossing that is yoga. Just sitting here and being able to be beyond that is what we are referring to as spiritual process. Something beyond the physical has become a living reality for you. So when you race, when you do various other adventure sports or when people live on the edge in so many different ways, what they are trying to is have a taste of coming close to the border. Those who cross the border, you don't see them because they're gone <laughs> So spiritual process gives you the freedom because you are crossing the limitations of your physicality, not through physical action, simply by your conscious… Uh, by… simply by your conscious will that you are crossing the physical limits. This is something you can race all the time, safely. So I am all the time on a race, constantly beyond the physical limitations. But if you try this physically, then there is a… you should not cross the limitation, you can hit the border. But if you cross the border, that means you lose your body. I think that's where… Yes, that's what was happening to you. I was always riding that… Trying to stick to the line and go a little beyond, you know, one of the great races… two cars over yeah. the edge, but… One of the great races of our time, Kenny Roberts said, when people asked him, how come you every time you manage to win five times world championship or something like that? He said, I go out of control with control. But that last word is the most important word. With I control. go out of control, but with control. I go out of control. No control means he's gone. So you're trying to do it physically. There's excitement in it. But there is limitation, you will never cross the limit. If you cross the limit, it's over. But the spiritual process is such that you can cross the limit all the time. There's no limit because you're crossing the limitations of the physical without physical activity. So if you learn to do this, you will see the border of the physicality can be stretched and stretched and stretched in many different ways. Instead of doing a week-long program, if you had… when you were fourteen, if you had come to me and done six-year program instead of six days program, okay? Now uh, your ability to push this to a different level, you push your ability to push your car to a different level and yourself to a different level would be very, very big because right now the car may not give up yet but your system gives up. Right the mental, psychological system, physical system, the energy system above all takes the maximum be beating at high speed. And I'll, I'll be honest, um, January, February of, of 07, before I did the program, I was giving up. My, phys my body was giving up and I was at a point where mentally and emotionally I was getting ready to give up totally and say, you know what, this isn't living. And um, I, just, I, I just can't express how grateful I am. <laughs> Um, for all you've done. Don't be grateful, just win a race <laughs> <laughs> I can handle that. We'll do that the best that we can. <coughs> so, um, again, I, I'm sure that a lot of people have many questions, but is there anything that you'd like to say um, to the audience before we answer some of their questions or...? I'm sure uh, naturally the questions will be, why is Sadhguru on the racetrack? So I want them to know that Sadhguru is not on the racetrack today, he's on the racetrack every day. There we go, yeah. <laughs> every moment of my life I'm on the racetrack, not racing with anybody, but definitely at full trouble with every aspect of my life. It's not just this or that. Probably for many people it may look, uh, what to say, because they have uh, a certain ideas that a spiritual person must… means he must be stayed, okay? So, 
if you have to be peaceful and joyful and blissful, if it is necessary that you must walk slowly, you can't meet people, you can't do anything in the world, you can only sit in a cave and be peaceful, obviously your peacefulness is extremely fragile. My peace, my blissfulness, my love is not fragile. If you take me to hell, I'll still be like this <laughs> It's not fragile. So I can continuously put myself into all kinds of activity and nothing of my qualities, who I am, is not threatened at any moment. So uh, it doesn't matter if I'm driving at hundred miles per hour, two hundred miles per hour. I'm still… you could have actually… it should have been good actually if we had check my pulse rate and my everything. I was just very normal, I heard you panting <laughs> In the beginning, I was so nervous that the car was not going to be right <laughs> at all, please. With all the problems that we had last night, you know, I told you how we, we blew up an engine yesterday in testing and then we ripped another engine out of something last night and we're cannibalizing cars left and right because I really wanted to try to make sure we had the right experience today. And <laughs> I was, I, I'll be honest with you, I was, I was nervous when we first got so in the car. So we should have checked my pulse rate, heart rate, blood pressure, everything. Before and after driving at two hundred miles per hour, I would be just about the same except for the physical right. shake-up that right. happens. <laughs> well, it was a lot of fun. I, I can't tell you, I, I, I really enjoyed that today. Uh, it's the first time I ever sat in the passenger seat of my own race car and I got to say that Sitting in the passenger seat of your race car with your guru is something that I don't think many people have done. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a very fortunate individual on many levels. <laughs> but, um, and you know, you said it, we're here to talk about life at full, full throttle. And um, I know many people have some questions, so if you guys like, fire away. I must tell you about my throttle experience. You know? Oh, yeah, please. During my motorcycling days when I was just traveling across, one day it happened, I was… Uh, from Mysore, I was riding up to a place called Uti. I don't know if you've been there, it's a hill station. No. And then uh, my motorcycle just, you know, it wouldn't throttle up. It's like, if you throttle up, it gets off, it floods and gets off. Wasn't a Toyota? No, 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 it's a motorcycle. It's <laughs> a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so… Normally you check uh, the fuel system and then the electricals because if you start, the mo motorcycle starts, if you throttle up, it gets off. So I checked everything. I opened up the carburetor, you know, these are old Czech bikes, the Czechoslovakian bikes. Nothing. Then, uh, then I… So there was a farm close by and I went and made friends with them and because it was getting late in the evening, it's, it's, why it's a wild country, it's like elephant and tiger country, that place. So my wife was also riding with me at that time and uh, so we went into this farm and uh, we said the motorcycle problem. So that guy also was a motorcycle enthusiast and we went in and we stripped down the whole thing, check this, check that, check that, everything. Nothing, everything is proper. Then they said maybe the alternator is not charging properly and we took it back and got it charged and bought, brought back twenty-four hours it took to do that. Whatever we did, it didn't start. And after one and a half days of looking at just about everything in the bike, we discovered these bikes used to have a… like a brass needle for the throttle, you know. When you throttle up, the needle comes up okay. and goes down. And the top of the brass uh, needle has a pin which is held by the, the throttle wire. Okay. And that pin has gotten cut. So uh, and then uh, we discovered after one and a half days of literally scanning the whole bike that the pin is cut everything else is fine. How does a pin get cut? Then uh, some crazy thing that there must be a fault in the, you know, the pin, something mm -hmm. must have broken. I failed. Yeah. So part, you know, a certain metallurgical failure or something because it's not something that sees any stress. It just has to go up to allow the gas and mm -hmm. go down when you cut the throttle, that's all. Then this happened to me four times in the next two years. I was the only guy that inside my headlamp I would always have two brass pins… Spares. Spares because I over throttle all the time. I hold up the throttle at the full and I'm not happy the way it's going and I want to throttle more and I'm cutting the throttle pin. <laughs> That's more than full throttle, isn't it? That's why they were breaking. 
I was stretching it beyond its thing all the time. <laughs> that's lovely. <laughs> and that's a great problem to have. And you know, it's funny because that's the kind of stuff that happens to us all the time. Not not that kind of problem, but you know. In those times, I always thought, I want to ride something, I want to drive something that I can't handle. Today, I think I was close to that. <laughs> you handled it pretty good. You handled it pr and especially for your first time, I've, there's only been one other person that's driven that car. And they are a 15-year veteran professional race car driver. And they got out of the car saying it's absolutely the fastest thing they've ever driven and uh, quite scared of it. So you did fantastic. It, it, was, it was pretty awesome. First time I was handling a machine that I, you know, like a brute, I couldn't handle it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was exciting to watch, you know, even over, even over the first couple laps, it was, it was very clear that, you know, you were meticulously picking away at every little detail because there's so many things going on in the car. Yeah, yeah. Not, I mean, not just the car, but the car, the track, there's so many different things that are happening. No, as the speed levels cross, the number of forces working upon the machine are just changing. It's a dramatic shift. Most people may not realize you driving at 80 miles per hour, you could do so many things and nothing happens. You just do 120 and over, suddenly the dynamics totally are different. You cross 160, 170 and suddenly the dynamics are very, very different. And you better do exactly what happens yes, yes. to happen there, right? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I was still, I would have needed much more time uh, probably to push this, to that machine to its fullest and be able to handle it totally. So it was good that I was driving something that I can't handle. Always I'm disappointed with the cars that I'm driving, however big they are, however powerful they are, I can handle them effortlessly. So this was a machine that I was lit to, struggling to handle. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I'll tell you what, luckily I know a guy that's always got a race car that's ready. So if you need to <laughs> get back in and you always know where to go. So, Tom, what are the questions? Let's okay. Go. First question. First question is, if by doing meditation I become peaceful, satisfied, won't I lose my hunger to do something worthwhile? If I become loving towards all, mm -hmm. won't I lose my competitive edge in the world? So you better tell the daredevil what's happened to you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, I can definitely say that life has changed a lot for sure. And I can't say that, I, you know, I've lost my competitive, my competitive edge at all. I, I must say that now, see, before when I was at the racetrack and things would happen, somebody would say something, somebody would do something, it would almost take me off my game at times. And I would end up sometimes doing something silly or making a mistake that I shouldn't have made just because I let somebody or something get to me. Ever since I've done the program, it seems like these things that people would always do that would really get to me and bother me or make me react, I'd be in a state of constantly reacting to this or that. It seems like now I've had a certain distance, you know. Um, it's so funny because even a month after I did the program, people were saying to me in the racing world, what, Chris, what's gotten into you? Like, is this the same person that we've known for the last seven years? Like, normally you know, this or this would happen and I'd whoosh, fly off the handle and, you know, rah, 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 and, and now it seemed like whenever... Maybe the engine should roar, not you. Exactly. <laughs> and it was always me roaring before. So to answer your question, um, I definitely haven't lost my competitive edge. If anything, it makes me that much hungrier to, to go faster, to do the things that I know that, that my team and I... and, and things that other people haven't done, but where there's a will, there's a way. And as long as we always keep our cool and do whatever is needed, you know, we've never won more races and been more consistently fast at every racetrack. Ever since I've taken the program, last season I won 12 races. I won almost, I won all but one race that we competed in, in the 2009 season. In the 2010 season, we had seven victories. In the 2008 season, we had 10 victories. And we've set almost 17 track, or excuse me, 18 track records in that time. And before, things like this just wouldn't happen. There would always be something that would catch us here or catch us there or, 
or should I say something that would catch me and I'd get caught in this trap. But now it's like, you gave me some Teflon or something <laughs> so I can slide through these things and come out kind of okay with no matter what happens. So it's um, after becoming meditative, everything around me has just gotten much, much easier. And um, it's, opened, it's opened my life up to joy and and um, in a way that I never thought I would have. You know, I always thought happiness had to come from, you know, winning a race or, or um, us getting a sponsor or something good on the out in the physical world happening to me. Now, um, that joy comes from ins with inside and it makes it a lot easier. It makes it effortless to do the things that I need to do. Even though we might be awake for days straight doing this, traveling, doing stuff that other people think, this is crazy. This is just life, and we're taking it. Now it's like before, you know, we're always on the rev limiter. Yeah, we might be at full throttle right now, but we're taking it nice and easy, and it, and it feels really good. Now, to be successful in racing, you need hot wheels but a cool rabber. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, if, if people can razzle you, you're going to be off your game. And if you're off your game at the wrong split second, disaster can strike, you know? So this is something that a lot of people fail to understand throughout their life. When it comes to external realities, every human being is differently capable, okay? However hard you try, you are not going to be better than yourself. So the only thing is, you should be able to perform at your best whatever you're doing, whether it's racing or life or whatever else. If you want to perform at your best, <coughs> today there is substantial medical and scientific proof to show you that if you can keep yourself utterly pleasant, if you can keep yourself blissful, loving, ecstatic within yourself, your chemistry functions at its best. Obviously that's the reason that why the experience is good. Your mechanical systems in the body functions at its best, your brain, your intelligence functions at its best. There is substantial scientific and medical evidence to prove this. So you drive well at a, on a certain day, not because you want to win a race, because your system is functioning well. People think they have to pump adrenaline into their system, get excited and drive and somehow manage to win. I would say, if you just look at all the machines, if the, some of the machine is better than what we're driving, that's a different thing. If they're equally paced and you look at people, before you start off, you should know anyway you're going to win because you know what this machine can do or cannot do. Or before you start off, you know anyway, you can't do it because today somebody is anyway better than you, you know. You know, um, a, very, a very classic example of that, um, in, the, in the late 90s, they were doing testing on the NASCAR drivers and they were checking heart rates and, and things of the sort in the morning before the race. And always, consistently, consistently, Dale, oh, already done that. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Dale Earnhardt Sr. consistently was always calm and cool as a cucumber. Always, was always, um, had the lowest heart rate, had low blood pressure. I mean, he always was the calmest and coolest. And it showed because, you know what? He was a... Uh, he was, in my eyes, he's the best NASCAR driver that ever lived, you know, and that should speak volumes of it. And, yeah. and that's why they called him the Intimidator, because nothing, nothing got him. You know, he was always, he was always like this. And because, because of that... you can only drive to your limitations. You cannot drive like somebody else. That's so with everything in your life. So instead of seeing how to explore the full potential of what this is, you're trying to ape, ape somebody else. That could be disastrous, you know. Yeah. And above all, lower your own performance. Yes. You know, and, and you also mentioned that, you know, when when you become meditative and these things start to start to balance out in your life, how everything in your system starts to work better. And again, that's another clear example of exactly what happened to me. You know, I was struggling just to maintain my weight before. I mean, I would, I was eating all sorts of food and. And for some reason, I was, I was, 
I was forcing myself to eat food, and I was eating a lot of food, but I was struggling to maintain my weight, and I would need to sleep 8 to 12 hours a day. I mean, I could not get out of bed unless I had to be at the racetrack before 11, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, it was... <laughs> Half the day's over by then. <laughs> yeah, sometimes 2 o'clock. And, you know, after, after doing the program, I found out that, you know, within two months' time, the amount of food I was eating dropped considerably, but instantaneously my weight went up right away I could maintain my weight um, my sleep quota went I mean skyrocketed down I went from you know 10 to 12 hours a day to four to six hours and I was and I, and I just kept saying you know this is too good to be true like I, I wanted to get on the top of the tallest mountain and scream like I know some of you are suffering out there please come do this please you know Look at me. Please learn from my experiences. Learn from the pain that I went through, the suffering. Like, nobody should suffer, you know, especially like I was suffering. And, you know, the amount of change I went through in four months was enough that I felt that everybody should have a piece of this. And whatever I can do to help bring a piece of this, I will do. And, you know, and it's, just, it's just been great being here. So, uh... The best tuned machines are done by me, not by you. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, um, do we want to go to the next question? Okay. How does one decide between risk, risking one's life for thrills and playing it safe for family and other obligations? That's yours. Oh, wow. <laughs> well... You know, there's, a, there's definitely a line between risking one's life and doing things for, for thrills. Um, obviously, any time you get in any type of vehicle or even cross the street, you're risking your life. Let's face it. Um, nine times out of ten, it's much, much safer to be sitting in a race car than it is your street car. Definitely. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people think, oh, these guys that race these cars, they're crazy, they're risking their life. We're all risking our life. You know, it's, it's fleeting out of all of us every day. So, you know... The last People thing I'm, have died sneezing. Absolutely. People have died, <laughs> you know. So I look at it like this. And I don't know, I don't know very much, and you know that, because I'm Italian. I don't, you know. We're always risking our life. The question is, is, are you willing to sit back and not do anything with your life and just sit back and play safe? Because if you are, how much of life are you really enjoying? Are you saving yourself for tomorrow? And then tomorrow, are you saving yourself for the next day? Because if that happens, one day you're going to wind up dead and have never done anything. And then you're going to say to yourself, well, I've played it safe my whole life, and I'm miserable, and I've never done anything. Then the suffering is. You know, you're, you're not going to be very happy. On the other hand, if you go out and ride wheelies all day and do things above and beyond that are, let's face it, can be flat out stupid, you know, you... you you have to understand, there, you know, there, there is a fine line when, in racing and, and doing anything between doing something going overboard or playing it safe. And um, neither one will get you anywhere, I don't think. Sure, you always, most always stay alive if you play it safe, but are you, are you alive if you're really dead in your living body? So, you know, I like to pick a, a nice balance in between. Now, granted, I've always kind of been on the risk-taking side, but in my eyes, I'm not taking risks. I'm living my life every second of it. And people just have to determine what it is that is most important to them in their life. You know, if family is the most important thing to you, then I would say yes, stay home. Or not necessarily stay home, but do things with your family. Live your life to the fullest with your family. Do as much as you can do without necessarily putting their life in jeopardy. But staying home with the family and not doing anything, are you really living there too? Or are you just trapped, you know? So that's how I look you at know, it. Uh, that reminds me, uh, I've been driving the last five years from Kathmandu to Kailash in the most incredible ter terrain. Anybody who wants to drive off-road, it's a driver's dream, <laughs> that kind of terrain. So this time we took uh, a certain members of the press with us, uh, some of the prominent English press in India. So this lady who drove with me 
And uh, she picked up the microphone after she got off and she said, Oh, he drives like a maniac. <laughs> I said, uh, Not one moment did you… Did you see me frothing? Did you see… <laughs> did you see me excited? Or as I sit in a satsang, I'm sitting in the car and driving, all right, I'm pushing it at full throttle but not like a maniac. So you don't understand the difference between mania and skillfulness of life. So one who has no skill about anything, he will think everything walking is a risk, you know. On two legs to walk, it's such a risky thing. <laughs> you could fall. <laughs> yes, you could fall and die, so many people have. <laughs> so risk is something only for the beholder, it's a risk. For one who is doing it, it is a calculated effort to do something in a certain way. So if you're just uh, trying to race on a regular street and uh, risking not just you, risking other people's lives, you have no business to do that. But what is considered risk by other people is actually a calculated way of life that you make the necessary calculations and shoot for that. Well, if you miss what will happen, well, you may not die racing, but you may be in the spectator stand and some other driver may kill you, <laughs> driving straight into the spectator stand. So this is not about risk-taking and above all, suppose you played it so safe that you did not leave your couch and you did not leave your potato chips, would your family like it? I don't think so. You took risks, you achieved something, whatever happens, your family always appreciates it. But you did nothing because you want to fulfill your obligations and want to be safe for them, I don't think they will appreciate it. No family will because they will be ashamed of you because you did nothing in your life <laughs> So I am not just saying everybody has to go and ra race a racing machine, but the way you live, if you did not stretch yourself to your limits in your job, in your ability to do things, whether you're playing a game or in your mind, in your emotion, in your body, if you did not show the full potential of who you are, I don't think uh, your family would be hugely obligated to you or proud of you or would even want to remember you. Very easily they'll forget you. <laughs> He's boring. Yes. No, I'm not saying this is for glory. I don't see racing or living life the way I live. I, I, I do not bother about what somebody else is thinking. Actually, when I was young, I had opportunities to go into competitive sports, but I participated on a sidetrack but never went into the competition because somehow I didn't like that whole atmosphere of people desperately wanting to win and some people crying because they did not win. I just thought, for me it was to, you know, stretching myself to the limit was the only fun. For me, entering the podium and everybody clapping their hands didn't mean anything at any time, nor does it mean anything to me even today. I feel uh, if any human being arrives at a certain state within himself, where for him to be joyful, to be blissful, to be loving, he is not dependent on anything outside. If he arrives at that place, every human being will become like this. What it means is, uh, today morning, you know, when we got into this machine, just flip the three switches and touch it, boom, it roars. Suppose it doesn't roar, you do many things. If it doesn't at all, then it needs to be pushed. Mm -hmm. It needs to be pushed and started. So if the racing machine is pushed off the track and started, there is no great harm. But if your joy needs a constant outside push, if your love needs a constant outside push, everything that's beautiful in you is on a push start, uh, that's a bad way to live. I would say everything that's beautiful about a human being should be on self-start. For you to sit here and be ecstatic, it should be self-start. If you wish right now, tears of ecstasy should flow out of you. That's how it should be. So if it's all on push start, then there is a certain enslavement in the whole process. So that enslavement is what you're trying to say, my family will like it. Your family will not like it. No human being appreciates it. 
Even your family will sit and watch somebody else is racing on the television. Yes. They won't sit and watch you sitting on the couch, eating potato chips and getting big. They're not going to sit and watch this with, you know, with excitement. They're also going to look at the television, you're also going to look at the television. Somebody else living their life to the fullest. It's time, it's not necessary that every human being has to go on a racetrack or jump off an airplane or do something. Different people have different competence, different types of competence and different types of inclinations. Whatever is your inclination, whether you are just pushing paper in an office or you're just running a simple family, even there there's opportunity to take yourself to full rev. In a simple family life of husband, wife and two children or one child or no child, whatever, even there every day, every moment there is an opportunity to live your life either full throttle or engine switched off <laughs> because it's safe. No, you must live full throttle. Full throttle need not necessarily mean being in a racing machine. I can ask You get that. No, oh, you know I get that. <laughs> I think we're going to take a quick break and uh, I think they're going to show the trailer one more time real quick. Okay. <laughs> I would like to see that.